official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Slugs will never miss you Coming from members that's official It's unexpected all right, so as I said last class, uh, today and going forward the rest of the semester, this is where we start talking about wh what the internals of a database system look like. Um, so we're talk today we're gonna start at the very bottom with files and pages on, on disk. Um, before we get to that though, uh, just go through what's, uh, what's due for you guys right now. All right, homework one and project zero are due this Sunday at, at midnight. Um, I think about, I think I checked this morning, about 100% or 100 out of 130 people have completed Project Zero. If you haven't started Project Zero, please get started now. And then homework one, again, it's not meant to be very taxing, but you write some SQL queries in DuckDB and SQLite. Uh, that's also due at the same day. And then so starting next week uh, on, on, on Monday, but maybe Tuesday, we'll release Project One. And this one is actually for a grade, and this will be implementing uh, a buffer pool manager, which we'll cover uh, in, in a few lectures. But we're, we'll get it out early. By now, since you, have, you completed Project Zero, you've already set up your, your development environment. So write code locally, so that shouldn't be an issue for anyone else, and so you can start banging on the code right away. So any quick questions about homework one or project zero? Who has not started project zero? Good, awesome. Every year, someone is always somebody. I'm glad to hear that nobody has waited that late. Okay, so, all right, last class was the, we talked the relational model and relational algebra, and, and then with SQL. Um, and that was just to understand what, we, what the application is going to see in the data at the logical level, um, that write SQL queries that hit up against tables. Um, and so going forward, as I said, at this point, we're not going to go revisit the relational model except to understand how we actually implement something that can support it. So we have to understand, again, what the application is going to see, and then now we'll start designing a system that can provide that logical view uh, for, for in a database. So the overall outline of the course is as follows. Uh, so we've already covered relational database. Again, that's the logical level. And then going down here, it's a bunch of the different layers of, of the system. And we're going to go in reverse order from, from how the system is actually implemented. So we're going to start at the very bottom, like at the disk layer, the storage layer, and then work our way up. And you know, talk about query execution, code and other things. Um, so you can sort of think that the conceptual database system we're going to be building throughout the entire semester is made up of a bunch of layers. Right, it's a very common approach in, in computer science and in, in software development is that you abstract away the details of different parts of the system and you just expose some kind of layer that has an API that, is, that the layers above and below it can, can interact with. Right, the operating system provides this, applications provide this. So our database system is going to work basically the same way. So again, at the, lowest, the lowest layer will be the thing that actually talks to a disk or non-volatile storage, as, as I'll explain in a second. Then we'll bring things into memory, the buffer manager. Then we'll expose a way to get access to the data we bring into memory through access methods. Then be a way to execute queries. And then lastly, it'll be a way to actually take a SQL query and plan it. So the application is floating up above here, right? And it's just going to send us SQL queries. And then it's going to basically tickle all the parts going down the stack to actually execute queries. In some cases, all your data is in memory, so maybe you don't go to the disk manager. Uh, but you, know, you don't want to always assume the case. So as I said, today's class and for the next two, two lectures, we're at this part here, the storage level. Like what, it actually, what does the database actually look like on disk? What's inside of the uh, you know, uh, files on disk? What do tuples actually look like? We're starting at that lowest level, and then again, we'll work our way up. So we'll first provide some background about, again, what, what it means to have a disk-based database system or a disk-oriented database system. Then we'll talk about what the files look like, what the pages look like. And think it's kind of going inside now. You know, the file is made of pages. Pages has, uh, has tuples inside of it. And then we'll talk about what the tuples look like. Next class, we'll talk more about like, the, actual, the layout of the bits or the bytes within actual attributes in the tuple look like. And then, as I said on, on the first lecture, uh, every Wednesday we'll have what we'll call a flash talk. So today will be Neon. Uh, one, he's a former Postgres developer, the co-founder of Neon. He's going to come give a 10-minute talk about, here's what Neon is, here's why it's interesting. And you may not understand everything he's going to talk about, but as we go throughout the semester, you know, a lot of it start, start to make more sense. Okay? So we'll try to stop at 3.10, and then we'll switch over to him uh, on Zoom to give, to, give, to give the talk. Okay? All right. So this semester, we're focusing on what I'll call a disk-based architecture, or disk-oriented database management system. What this means is that 
we're going to design the software inside of our database system to assume that the primary storage location of data, of the database that we're managing in our database management system, is going to be on non-volatile disk. Right? And so what the system is essentially doing for us is orchestrating the movement of data back and forth between non-volatile storage and memory. Right? It's a classic von Neumann architecture. Right? You, have, you have storage, you have some kind of disk thing. You can't operate directly things on disk. Not entirely true with some modern hardware. We could ignore that. But you can't operate anything on disk. You've got to bring it into memory. Then there's this thing called the CPU that's going to do some computation on it to, to manipulate the data or get, extract answers that you're looking for. So our whole system, the entire semester, really is me around this key idea here, that we've got a bunch of things on disk, we've got to bring it into memory and to, to, to be able to process it. And the tricky thing is going to be, as we see as we go along, is, OK, if I write something in memory, how do I make sure it safely lands on disk? Right? That'll be a whole other uh, uh, you know, several lectures to discuss how we're going to do that. But for now, we'll just assume we got something on disk, we're going to bring it to memory. How do we do that? So the way to think about now the hardware that we're going to interact with and we have to support in our, in our data management system is typically through this hierarchy like this. And I'm sure you've seen some kind of variation of this in, in other classes. But the way to think about this is that at the, at the top level of, the, of this hierarchy, you have what's the most fastest thing you can have, a CPU register. right? There's only so many registers on the CPU. That's the fastest thing you can access data from in, in your CPU. And then below that, you have CPU caches, DRAM, like, you know, uh, like memory, SSDs, spinning disk hard drives. And then network storage would be like a distributed file system or you're on Amazon S3, something like that. right? So again, this, this, this hierarchy is not, is not novel, not that interesting to by itself. The thing that we care about in this class is understanding how the things get slower and faster and smaller and larger as you go up and down the stack. And that's going to determine what algorithms, what data structures you're going to use to maintain data at these different levels. Right? So at the lowest level, things are really big, a lot slower, uh, but a lot larger. Like S3, for my purposes here, it's infinite storage. Right? At, there obviously, is a limit because there's only so many physical drives at Amazon. But like your, your credit card will run out of money before you can store enough data there. Right? But the very, very top is CPU registers, right? Those things, there's make maybe a couple dozen of them, depending on what CPU you're using, right? So we have to understand, like, if, as we move data back and forth, you know, what tier are we at? How is it actually should be accessed, and how much can we actually put into it? And that'll determine again what algorithms we may, may want to choose. This division line here is also going to be important to us because anything above this division line is going to be volatile, meaning if I pull the plug on the machine, whatever is being stored in there is, is gone. Right? Not as active for DRAM. I think the studies show you pull the plug on DRAM and it lasts for like 30 seconds before the charge runs out. But for CPU caches and everything else, like, it's, it's all gone. Right? Anything below this line is non-volatile, meaning like I have an SSD, I write some, store, write some data there. We'll discuss when the hardware lies to you. But it comes back and says, yes, I stored it for you. You pull the plug and you come back, it should be there. Right? The other key difference is that anything above this line is going to be byte addressable. What does that mean? I mean, it's in the name. It's addressing bytes. So, so what does that mean? I could jump to any offset. Sorry, yes, go for it. Like the smallest unit of memory is a byte. Right? He says the smallest unit of memory is a byte. So what does that mean? He said if you want to query something, I'm using the word query because that sounds like a SQL query. But like, if you want to access something, the, the, you can access it at a fine grain at, at a byte. Right? Not entirely true because there's cache lines, but like, we, we can ignore that for here. Um, and then block storage would be what? Like an SSD, I can't go get like it's some random offset. Just give me 64 bits at this offset. I got to bring in the whole page at a block, which are typically four kilobytes, right? Just to access a small, small piece of it. And again, that's going to determine what data structures, what algorithms we're going to use, depending on what, you know, what, uh, what, how, how it's addressable, how to get access to the data, right? So now, again, this is the canonical classic hierarchy you may, may see. In modern hardware, the lines are starting to get kind of blurred, right? So like you have, uh, all right, sorry, sorry, before we get there. So for this, for this class in this semester, we're going to refer to anything that's in DRAM as just memory, right? We're going to ignore CPU caches and all that. That's in the advanced class for now. And then anything below this, what is called disk, right? Whether it's S3 or an SSD or a spinning disk hard drive, I'm just going to say disk, assume it means something down here. I was saying where the lines get blurry is uh, you have things like fast network storage where it 
it's not, it's not local to you, but you can access it pretty quickly. And it may be durable because you don't actually know what you're writing to, right? Like networks are getting uh, much faster than the CPUs these days. Then there's this other class of uh, storage called persistent memory. Who here has ever heard of Optane from Intel? One, two, three, right? What happened to it? No, it's dead, right? <laughs> um, Intel is hemorrhaging money, uh, and then the new CEO came in 2022 and killed it off. But what was amazing about this was it was specialized hardware that, that sat in the DIMM slot like DRAM, but if you, you pull the plug on it, it would actually retain whatever you're storing, right? So if, had Intel not killed this off, a bunch of these lectures we, we were talking about, the buffer manager, a lot of that goes away in this class because no longer are you moving back and, data back and forth between DRAM and disk, because this thing is just persistent memory, right? It's not as fast as DRAM. You got to flush things. It's a bit more tricky, right? And it can wear out. There's always issues like that. But you know, th had this really taken off, this would have been a, a game changer for databases. Um, and we, would, we wouldn't be talking about disk-oriented systems, about moving pages back and forth. It would be about designing systems that access this directly, which is what an in-memory database does, which we're not going to talk about in this class. But there are systems where you don't assume everything's on disk. You assume everything's in DRAM. So if you assume everything's in persistent memory, then that, that changes a lot. But like I said, Intel killed this. It doesn't exist. And what's replacing it now is this thing called CXL. Um, there's sort of different types of CXL, but the one that we're going to care about, what well, we can talk about a little bit uh, later on, is CXL type 3, which is basically byte addressable memory that may not actually reside on, on your physical machine. Right? Samsung will sell you a device that will sit in the, on the PCI, PCIe slot. So it's like expanding the number of DRAM slots. You can go down the PCIe. But like, there's, there's no reason it has to be on the same box. You could go over the network for something else. It's called disaggregated memory. So that could be a game changer too, because now I could design a system where I'm writing to memory in CXL, but on the other side is some fast SSD, and I'm, I'm retaining things. Right? These are this is emerging hardware. There's no real system taking full advantage of this yet. No, no database system. But this might be a, a you know, game changer going forward. Right? But for our purposes, we're going to assume, again, it's, we have disk. We have memory. One's byte addressable and fast. One is block addressable and slower. And we're, we're ha we'll, have to, we'll have to handle that in our system. Another way to think about, again, these devices is through how fast they are. And again, you might have seen uh, something like this. Sometimes attributed to Jeff Dean has a version of this. But I think prior to that, there was Jim Gray had a version of this as well in, in the 1990s. But it's just a way to think about the, the relative performance differences between these different devices so that, again, when we design the different components or algorithms in our system, we have to know what we're actually talking to or we're going to read and write from. And we'll choose some algorithms over other based on the properties that they have. Right? So like, at a high level, doing L1 cache reference is about 1 nanoseconds. All right? And going down, you're down to what is that, a million nanoseconds to read tape archives. Um, or it's, a, it's a billion, sorry. Right? That's, it's like something like Amazon Glacier or like physical tapes from their backups. Nobody, nobody would store, you know, nobody would run a database system off tape archives, but they exist. So if you think of nanoseconds, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it because humans don't really can't think of like that, that, that sort of minute uh, measurement. But Jim Gray had an uh, easy uh, way to think about this. If you just change one nanosecond to a second, now you see how ridiculous the numbers actually are and the performance difference, right? orders, orders, magnitude, uh, performance differences. And so that we're going to design our system to try to keep everything we can in DRAM because it's just going to be so much faster than having to go from disk. But of course, we're not always going to be able to, to do that. So the way I think of this also too is like say for, for instead of like reading a reading piece of memory, I want to read something from a book. If it's in L1 cache, then it's like me reading the book off this table that's really fast. If it's like on a, uh, on, in DRAM, maybe I got to walk over to the library and go read the book. But if it's uh, in a tape, I got to fly to Pluto to read one page in a book. Right? It's, it's that much slower. I'm going to avoid reading, writing from disk as much as possible. But it's not always going to be possible. Now, another key difference in this hardware that we're going to care about, uh, the, the, the storage devices, is the notion between sequential and, and random access. And this is going to be different than how you maybe think about algorithms and data structures in your other courses, because you know, in, in the theory world, you assume everything's pencil and paper, everything sits in memory. It's, you know, it doesn't matter how you access things. But in real, in real storage devices, there is a difference depending how much data you're accessing and in what manner. So random access or non volatile storage is almost always going to be slower than doing sequential access. So what does random access mean? It's in the name of DRAM, right? So he says you could be getting data from completely different locations. So what does sequential access mean? 
Well, we're, we're NOR caches, right? It says nearby. Basically, the, the data is contiguous, right? And if you, if, it's kind of maybe hard to wrap your head around this in terms of an SSD because that's all digital. There's no moving parts inside of uh, in flash storage. But you know, think of like an old school spinning disk hard drive, which still exists in a lot of systems today, right? That's a, it's basically a platter of rust spinning around really fast, floating in helium. And then there's this arm, like an old vinyl record player that you have to put down and read bits off of the, the, of the platter as they spin. So if I'm doing sequential access, then I move the arm once, plop it down, and then read as much data as I can uh, off, off of the device and then shove it up to the CPU to, to do processing on it. But if I'm doing random access and I'm, I'm literally physically moving the arm, jumping out a bunch of different locations, and that's a physical movement that, that can be slow. And therefore, the, the speed of sequential versus random is going to be orders of magnitude faster because I don't have that physical issues. Now, SSD, the performance difference is, is slightly less because, but there is, there, sequential is still going to be faster. And we, we can talk about how to do parallel operations as well on modern devices, that, and, and that's next week. So what does this mean? That means that when we design our database system, and again, as we design the data structures and the algorithms, we're going to choose things that are going to maximize the amount of sequential I.O. that we, we can do. That means that we may lay out data in such a way so that if we have to spill the disk because we ran a DRAM, we can write all that sequentially because sequential writes is certainly going to be faster than random writes. We'll see this later with MySQL. The way MySQL writes uh, dirty pages from memory to disk, they'll first write to this side buffer as a sequential write, get that on disk, flush that. That's faster than doing random write. And then in the background, they would then actually go update the physical pages, which may be in, in random locations. Right? So they'll write data twice, because they'll write it out sequentially first. That's fast. Commit that. Tell the outside world your, your, your data is safe. Then in the background, they'll do the random writes and hide that from you. Right? So there's a bunch of tricks like that that seems crazy. Like, why would you want to write something twice? It's because you want to avoid random access. In SSDs, there'll be a bigger difference also in terms of uh, reads versus writes. Like reads will be much faster than, than writes in SSDs. But that's less, less of an issue in, or not so much an issue in spinning disk hard drives, right? So the way we'll see next class, the way we're going to try to uh, sort of maximize the storage of our data to be sequential or continuous as much as possible is that when it comes time to allocate memory, or sorry, allocate pages on disk, we'll try to act, act, or allocate large chunks at a time so that to an extent so that the OS kind of try to write them out sequentially. So if we say we know we're going to store a bunch of data in, in, on disk in the future, so that, rather than allocating four kilobytes at a time, maybe we're allocating a megabyte. And yes, there's some unused space, but storage is cheap these days, that's OK. And then that, that ensures or tries to uh, increase the likelihood that our data is being stored sequentially. We'll do an example with Postgres later on, where it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem they, they actually do that, though. All right, so the overall design goals we're going to have for our system, not just for the storage level, but also for you know, the rest of the semester, is that we're always going to design our system in such that we can assume that any time we try to go access data, it may not be in memory. It's on disk. And we have to protect ourselves while we go out and get that data from disk. And we have to support databases that are larger than the amount of memory that's available to us on the, the single machine. All right, what does that sound like? If you've taken the OS class, I'm going to let my data system pretend it has more memory than it actually has. Virtual, Virtual memory, yes. And then we'll see this later on, though. Uh, we don't want to rely on the operating system to do this management for us. We don't want to rely on its virtual memory. We're going to do everything ourselves because we can always do it better. All right? All right, so again, we handle uh, databases that exceed amount of memory from us and give the illusion to the user that we can still support it. Uh, we're going to try to, to, since reading and writing disk is so expensive, we're going to try to avoid, uh, anytime we have to read a lot of data, avoid large stalls uh, in our system and let, try to let always something do, do some useful work for us. Not always possible. If everybody's trying to read from disk and the disk is slow, you're blocked. But we can design other things to, to avoid this. And as I said, random access is always going to be much slower than sequential access, so we'll try to maximize sequential access. That may mean, mean we do more work. Uh, at, in, you know, at the CPU level, but it's going to be better for us in the long run. All right, so this is a lot of hand wavy, a lot of, a lot of text, a lot of talking. Let's just look at what a disk oriented system looks like. So at the lowest level on disk, there's a database file. Databases, yes, are just files on disk. There's nothing special about them. Uh, well, I mean, databases are special, but there's nothing 
they're not like a special file that the operating system uh, knows how to handle or, or do something special with. It just sees a bunch of files, right? And that's that's the that's the sort of the base, the foundation. We're going to build, uh, you know, more complicated things on top of them. So our database file is going to have this uh, uh, some some data at the beginning. We'll call it the directory. I'll explain what that is in a second. But the thing is, like, it's metadata that tells me what's in my my file. And then we're going to break up the the file into a bunch of pages. I'll explain what that is in a second. It, think of like a block. Sometimes, sometimes you see things where there's blocks or pages, right? It's just a way to divide up the data that's in my file at typically fixed offsets so I know how to jump to things more, more quickly. And again, in this example here, I'm showing one database file. We'll see Postgres in a second. It could be multiple files. Like SQLite, DuckDB store things as one file. Postgres stores it in multiple files in, in a bunch of different directories. But for our purposes, we don't care. Then up above in memory, we're going to have this thing called the buffer pool, sometimes called the buffer pool manager, sometimes called the cache manager, different database systems called different things. But this is basically be memory managed by the database system that we're going to use to bring pages into, into, you know, from disk into memory. And then some other thing on the side we'll cover later uh, as we get close to the midterm and after the midterm called the execution engine. Think of this as like the query engine, the thing that executes SQL queries and knows how to read and write data from, from the buffer pool manager. So some query shows up. And it wants to do something, and the execution engine says, I need to go get page two to execute this query. So the first thing the database system has to do is says, well, in order for me to find page two, I have to have this directory in. Because that's basically, again, like the lookup table says where to go find page two and what offset or what file. Again, different database systems do different things. We'll see that in a second. So now, once this directory is in my buffer pool, uh, you can th think of this as like the, the TLB, the transla translation look aside buffer in, in, at the CPU level. Same, same idea. But once my directory is in memory, then I can consult that and say, where do I find page two? And say it tells me it's, it's in this file, this offset. So I do now a, a, a disk read, either through the OS or through direct IO, to go get the data from the disk file and put it into my buffer pool frame. And then now, once it's in my frame, I hand back the execution engine that, or the, the thread that requested, the worker that requested this page, I give it a pointer to that page, because now it's in memory. And we'll talk about how we make sure that things don't get swapped out when we hand off the pointer, but that comes later. Then the execution engine can then interpret whatever's in those bytes uh, in that page, depending on what it knows to try to access. Is it an index? It knows how to access index pages. If it's a table, it knows how to access table pages, right? With what these attributes and these types and so forth. All that comes later. And then let's say I want to write some data to this, update it. So I'll write back to the, the, that address, the pointer that I got. This page gets updated. At some point, I'm, the system will say, okay, well, it's time to swap this thing out, flush it out. So it's going to write it back to my disk file, make sure that's all durable and safe, and you know, give back an acknowledgment to the, to the application, or to the execution, that the data has been successfully written. So at a high level, this is what this entire semester is about, is this little, little diagram here. And of course, the devil's in the details. How do we do this safely? How do we do this efficiently? All that we'll cover as we go along. So today's lecture and the next two lectures next week will be what's in this file. Right? What are the contents of these pages? What do they look like? What do tuples look like? How can I organize the, the, the hierarchy of these pages if I, ha if I need to? Then, uh, on starting after that, lecture six will be the buffer manager and also handle disk writes. We'll discuss how do we fetch things from, from, from disk into memory, where do we store it in memory, how do we keep it safe in memory, and then how do we go write it back out if need, need be. The writing back out will come after the midterm because you have, to, you have to make sure things are durable and flush. But that, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about it. And then, uh, starting at lecture 13, 14, and so forth, we'll then talk about how we actually execute queries. OK? So this is the all roadmap where we're going uh, for, the, for the next couple lectures, up until the midterm. All right, so there's two problems now with database storage. First is, how do we repre represent data in our files on disk? And then how do we move those, th that data back and forth from disk to memory? And as I said, today's class uh, and next class is on this. And then problem two is when we talk about the buffer manager or me memory management in lecture six. Okay? So, as I said, the database at its core, a disk oriented database system, is essentially a bunch of files, one or more files on disk. Again, SQLite stores everything as a single file, other systems are going to store it across multiple files. And the, typically, the database is going to, or the database system is going to maintain data in these files in a proprietary format that is specific to that particular database management system. So what I mean by that is, 
you typically can't take like Postgres data files and then start opening them up in MySQL and read them because MySQL doesn't know anything about it, right? DuckDB is special because DuckDB is trying to be compatible with a bunch of things. You can take a SQLite database file and DuckDB knows how to read that. Uh, it might be able to connect to Postgres and other things. Um, but typically, you know, the, the, the secret sauce of, of what the database system is actually going to store data is only known by that data dependent system. Now, there's a movement in, in the last 10 years over these portable open source fi or open file formats like Parquet or Orc. You may have heard of Apache Arrow, things like that. Right? These are meant to be uh, universal file formats that any database system can read and write to. We'll cover that, that next week. But most of the systems you can think about, the Oracles, the MySQLs, the Mongos, Postgres, are all going to have their own proprietary formats. And these files are just sitting on what I'll call off-the-shelf file systems, EXT4, XFS, I don't know what the Windows one is, is called these days, um, WinFS, whatever. Like, these are just files sitting on the regular file system. There's, there's nothing special from the file system or the operating system's perspective. There's nothing special about these files except for the data system does with them. Now, there was attempts in the 1980s to not use the operating system's built-in file systems. So, again, not use ext4 if you're running Linux today. And instead, they would ship with their own custom file systems to operate directly on the raw blocks of data in, in storage. Um, most systems do not do this uh, because the overhead of it's so hard to build a database management system, but now you got to build a file system for it. That's super hard to do. You typically see this in the high end uh, enterprise database systems. So, Oracle, for example, will sell you something called uh, automatic storage management, or ASM. And like without ASM, it would look like this you have, a, you, have the, you have your database system, you have operating system, file system, logical model manager, and then you have a bunch of, you know, a bunch of disks. With ASM, you get rid of the logical file, uh, get rid of the file system managing the OS and the logical manager, and then you have this thing running in user space that can do direct I/O and, and manage everything uh, for you down there. Beyond performance, there's other management benefits because now you have a single interface with the database to manage all your storage versus having to SSH into the box and and, and muck around with the file system. Uh, again, typically you only see this at the enterprise enter enterprise level. Mo most systems aren't going to do this. And for our purposes, we're going to ignore that possibility as well. So again, we're just going to assume that we're running on off-the-shelf file system and we're just reading, reading running files down there. So the, the, the data system is going to have this thing called a storage manager, or disk manager, uh, uh, file manager sometimes. It has storage engine might be called another term. Like they're, they're all basically the same names, with the, different names of the same thing. And so the storage manager is responsible for managing these files on disk. And it can have components that can be responsible for the movement of data back and forth, meaning they do their own disk scheduling to decide, here's a bunch of requests that I have, how to line them up or batch them up and then and dispatch them. Or in some systems, you just let the OS do it for you. Right? You call it fread and, and let the OS figure out when to schedule your read. And as I said, these files are just going to be a, a bunch of collection of pages. Uh, and the database system is, going to be, is responsible for figuring out what data is being read and written to these pages, and when things get, uh, you know, if, if I delete things, how to reuse that space, how to do compaction, uh, how to expand pages or sorry, expand data across different pages and move it around depending on what the application is trying to do in the data. Most data systems are not going to maintain multiple copies of pages on disk. Uh, we assume that this is either going to happen at the lower level below us, like the hardware level, like you can buy like things like storage devices, like storage appliances, or you, even if you use Amazon S3, they'll, they'll replicate that for you and make multiple copies. So the database system is not going to be responsible for writing out multiple copies for redundancy. All right, we'll do this other ways, but we assume somebody else is going to manage that for us. Or it can happen above the storage manager at like a sort of a sort of upper part of the system can do replication. So one re, one write request shows up, it can then dispatch that write request to other copies of the database system running somewhere else. But at the lowest level, we're not going to be responsible for like for one page, write it out four times and have 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 duplicates. The MySQL exam I said before, that's for performance reasons. They'll write it out sequentially, right? But then they blow away the sequential file once they've updated the, the random file. Right? And for this class, we're also going to assume we're talking about tables, uh, table data. But you can imagine if you have indexes or other database objects, all of these properties still hold as well. Right? But we'll, we'll cover those later. All right, so again, storage manager is going to manage a bunch of files that are sitting on disk. And then within those files, now we're going to break those up into pages. 
And in almost nearly all systems, a page is going to be a fixed size block of data within, within that file. Now, I can have multiple files that have different page sizes. Uh, like the, again, the enterprise systems let you do that. But f for our purposes, assume that you know, a single file has a single page size. And just a way to break, break up the file into fixed offsets so you can jump to things very quickly. We'll see how to do that in a second. So within a page, we can obviously we can contain data, like tuples for, 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 our, for our table. Uh, there can be metadata about the, the data that we're storing, like what was the last timestamp of, of when this page was updated, or checksum of what the page content should, should, should look like. We can maintain log records about changes that were made that we may have not applied to the rest of the data. Some indexes allow us to jump to things more quickly within a page. Right? The contents of a page also, too, are going to be uniform, meaning they're only going to be for a specific entity within the database itself. So, I mean, you're typically not going to mix, mix in tuples from one table and another table in the same page, or tuples from an index and a table together in the same page. So, systems will do that. We'll cover that in a second. But, like, mostly it's going to be all homogeneous. Some systems are, are require a page to be self contained. And that means that all the information you need to understand what's inside the page has to be stored in the page itself. Let me take a guess why that's a good idea. She says, if you read the whole page together, you don't have to understand other pages to understand what's inside that page. Yeah. So when would, you, when would that help? So he says, if I need to understand what's in page one, I can just stay in page one and get all the information I need and not have to go to page three. So again, think of an extremes. Think of like my table has a billion tuples and say it's one, one tuple per page. I have a billion pages. Then would I want to go re-examine every single page over and over again to understand what's inside of it? So the self-containment thing is good for disaster recovery. All of you are young. All of you have, have, have you know, new hardware uh, and are not running enterprise systems. It breaks all the time. And so Oracle famously does this because they want to be able to use this for disaster recovery, meaning if my machine catches on fire and melts half the disk, then I can still recover some data because I have enough metadata about what's in the page within the page itself. So most systems don't work this way. Most systems will store, have a separate page for the metadata that tells you what the schema is, the catalog about what's, what's actually the, the contents of a table, like the attributes and, and, and the data types. And so if that part of the disk melts, I then can't you know, interpret what the others, other bits are. But what's that? Yes? So wouldn't create more copies of metadata pages be he, more helpful for a system? He said, wouldn't that create more copies of metadata pages that would be more helpful? Yes. But it doesn't, like, what if those catch on fire? Right? In the back, yes. So what if the directory page directory is missing? He says, what if the, the page directory is missing? So again, hopefully none of you have to deal with this, but if it's a true disaster, like the page directory is missing, uh, half the disk is melted, you pay for someone to fly out, take the disk, extract whatever data they can off it, and, and like almost like a, you know, like the, when there's ever a plane crash, the, 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 the federalities show up and try to figure out what actually happened. They literally would sit and look at the bits page by page and try to figure out what's in it. You pay a lot of money for that. Uh, obviously, you want to back up as much as possible, but like, you know, in the old days, this was not uncommon, right? Harvard got cheap enough where it's, you, can, you can have enough copies. It's less of an issue. But like, that's why they do it. Yes? So it's like, I assume that like, if the metadata remains content, in, like, and the actual content, there's some bits corrupted, it is easier to recover. But what if the metadata is not she says, uh, within the page, if the, if the metadata is corrupted, but the, the data itself is fine, what can you do? So you would, you'd also have a checksum per page. Some systems will do this. So you would know whether it's corrupted, because the checksum won't match. Then you can decide, a human would have to decide, OK, is it the data that's messed up? Is the metadata messed up? Again, then, then you can say, OK, well, it's the metadata. But I have another page I know from, from the same table over here. It should have the same metadata. Let me go use that. But that's, that's a manual thing. Like the human literally sitting and looking you know, page by page. I don't, I, that's a job I don't want to have. 
right? Um, but again, they get paid a lot of money to do, to do that, right? All right, so again, but we, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss how to do disaster recovery stuff la later. Um, but again, just be mindful that sometimes you store extra metadata that seems redundant, but it, you're doing it for recovery reasons, right? So every page is now is going to be given a unique identifier, which we call the page ID. Again, the term block might be used, block ID. It's essentially the same thing. And this page ID is going to be a way for us to uniquely identify some page within either the database management system, within a file, within a table, or an index. Right? Different systems are going to do different things uh, depending on what the layout of the files are for them. Again, SQLite is a single file, so the page ID will just give you an offset within, within the file. Whereas in Postgres, the page ID is unique per table. And so you go look up the file to say, what, for this table, what file do I want? And then I know how to jump to an offset based on that page ID. And so this, this page ID is going to be useful for us because it's going to provide us a way to have an indirection layer to map page IDs to physical locations. And that's going to help us later on. We'll see it in a second because now we can potentially move pages around and not have to update a bunch of other metadata that may be pointing to that page or data structures that are pointing to that page. Because as long as they have the page ID and there's something recording where to find that page, we don't have to update a bunch of different things. And we'll see how this really helps us later on when we talk about record IDs. So what's confusing in databases now, there's actually three notions of pages in a database system, right, in a computer. So at the lowest level, there's a hardware page, right? And this is going to be what the hardware exposes to you as the, the largest size of an atomic write they can actually do. And this is, for historical reasons, this is always going to be four kilobytes. So what do I mean by atomic writes? What does that mean? Yes. He says, uh, smallest contiguous region of memory, or say, say block of data that I can continuously write. And what? What does that mean, though? Without, he said, without being interrupted by another reader, right? We're not doing interrupts here. Yes. So either everything is done, or nothing is done. Yeah, she said, either it, everything is get written, all, it's all or nothing. So if I say to the database system, write this four kilobyte block to me, or write this four kilobyte block for me, and then I give it to the hardware. The hardware says, yep, I got it, and gives you back the acknowledgment. If you crash and come back, you should be somewhat guaranteed that that block is going to be there. If I have to write two four kilobyte blocks, so a total of eight kilobytes broken up across two blocks, I can't have the hardware guarantee me that it's going to write both blocks exactly or none of them. It might write the first one, then crash, and I come back, and I only have part, half the data I'm looking for. All right? Again, we'll see how, to, how, we, how we avoid this problem later on. Uh, but this is, you know, this is something, and again, the hardware is going to lie to us too, and the operating system is going to lie to us. We'll, we'll see that next class. Uh, but this is something we have, to, we have to be mindful of when we, when we start writing things out. Right? Then there's the OS has a notion of, of pages. By default, it's, it's four kilobytes because that's what x86 did in the 80s or something like that. Um, this is. Uh, in newer versions, you can get uh, what are called huge pages. So this is either two megabytes or one gigabyte. Again, we'll cover this uh, later on. But for our purposes, assume that the OS is going to keep track of four kilobyte pages uh, in, in, in virtual memory. And then now within the database system, built on top of an OS page, which is built on top of the hardware page, we can have different size pages. And it's going to vary uh, per system, right? So the uh, you know, uh, four kilobytes is very common in like S SQLite. Actually, SQLite can go down to 512 bytes. Uh, you, you can change this. Um, other systems like RocksDB and WireTiger, which WireTiger is the storage manager for MongoDB, right? These guys are going to use four kilobyte pages. SQL Server and Postgres can use eight kilobyte pages, and then MySQL can go up to uh, by, or by default is 16 kilobyte pages. And again, the enterprise servers like DB2, you actually can set the page size, the database page size, on a per table basis. Right? You can make one table be, be 64 kilobyte pages, and another table be 4 kilobyte pages. Yes? How do we view the 16 kilobyte uh, database page based on 1 gigabyte or 2 and the OS page? The question is, how do I, how do I build a, uh, if I'm using huge pages, how do I use a 16 kilobyte page if the, if the OS is managing uh, 2 megabyte pages? You just have multiple database pages within, within that. 
we'll cover huge pages later on. Uh, there was a thing called transparent huge pages. The OS tried to be clever and try to automatically convert your pages into huge pages. That was a disaster. Uh, we'll cover that later. <laughs> uh, but again, but just, all right, so, so I say it again. Sometimes you want four, sometimes you can have a table have four kilobyte pages in DB2. Sometimes you can have 64 kilobytes. Why would you want to, why would you want to choose one page size versus another page size? Yes. I guess if it's better for your operating system of its default page size. He says if it's better for your operating system's default page size. Ignore the OS in this. Yes. He says it depends on the structure of the data. What do you mean? He said, if your rows are smaller, it's better to have smaller page sizes. Well, if my rows are smaller, then within one page fetch, I can bring in more data or more rows, right? Yes? If you research to be at a finer grade and already choose smaller page size? She says, if your research to be at a finer grade later, you choose a smaller page size. Yeah. And then plus also writes. So if I have really large database pages and I update one kilobyte, but my page size is 64 kilobytes, the data system has to write out that 64 kilobyte page on disk, right? Again, this, this is for assuming block-based storage. I can't just write out small, small updates. I got to write the whole thing. And because now the system is organizing my page, my, my files within these larger page sizes, I got to make sure all the entire page makes it out. Because I may reorder things we'll see in a second, depending on how I'm, I'm going to implement what's inside the pages. So this will be a reoccurring theme across computer science and especially in databases. There's going to be no free lunch. There's going to be pros and cons to different design choices. And it's really going to depend on what our data looks like, which he, he sort of talked about. But it also depends on what our workload looks like, which she talked about. If I'm read heavy, I'm doing a bunch of sequential scans on data, then I want really large page sizes. Because now I'm going to read the entire, you know, I'm going to read all the data within the page. So I want to go one fetch, get, to do a sequential read, to go bring in a big page into to my buffer pool and just rip right through it, throw it away, and go get the next page. But if I'm doing a lot of small writes, then maybe I want a smaller page size. Because then now, if I'm, if I'm writing a bunch of different random pages that are just you know, physically in different, you know, different locations, yes, that's going to be random writes, but now I'm not bringing a bunch of useless data that I don't need. We'll see next week an even crazier idea. You're, we're all using the term rows to represent data or tuples. What if we don't store it as a row? What if we store it as columns? So now within a page, I just have one column. That's another way to design a system as well. Again, we'll cover that next week. But there's, there's a lot of different ways to think about uh, how we want to organize, organize our databases uh, at the lowest level. And it's going to have trade-offs depending on what we want to do with it. All right, so the, the different data systems are going to manage the, 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 the pages that are in the files and just in different ways. The most common ones going to be through heap files, which I'll explain in a second. And it's basically just I have a bunch of pages that are unordered, and tuples can land in, in any location. Uh, we'll see tree files or index organized uh, structures ne next week. Um, and then historically, sometimes there's things called sequential files or sorted files or ISAMs. This is stuff from like the 70s or 80s. Think of like the pages are sorted in the, some value based on the tuple itself. Um, and you sort of have a, like an indexing data structure on top of that. Well, it, it, it's sort of not, it's a, I'm going to say it's deprecated. It's a, it's a concept or a technique that people don't use anymore. Most systems are going to be using the, uh, the, the heap files, all right? So again, I also say too, at this point, I sort of mentioned, oh yeah, you can store things as row store, as a column store, but it, we actually don't need to know anything about what's inside of our pages yet, right? We just, there's some data, we need to be able to, a way to, to address it. And the heap file is gonna be the, the most common one. So the heap file is just gonna be a unordered collection of pages uh, that are stored in, in random order. I mean, the, the data itself is gonna be in some random order. And we'll use a, the page ID and some, some additional metadata to tell us where to go find the data that we want. And so the only in interface or API we need to expose at the, the storage manager level, if we're doing heap files, is the ability to create pages within the heap file. The, 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 the table is getting bigger, and I need to append more, more pages at the bottom of it. Um, I need to get a page based on some page ID. You need to write data to a page uh, and have it flush to disk. And then I need to be able to delete page. And I need to expose some kind of iterator in case I'm doing a sequential scan where I want to walk through page by page within my, my heap file. So to make all the work, there's some additional metadata we need to do to keep track of what's, you know, where the files are located physically on the, on, on the file system for us. 
uh, and then what space is available within, within it. Right? So if our database is a single file, the metadata we need maintained is pretty simple to find pages. Because right? we can do simple arithmetic to say, if I want page number two, all my pages are the same size. So I take my page number that I want, multiply it by the page size, and that tells me how to jump to an offset within that file to, fi to find the thing that I need. Right? This is what essentially what SQLite does, but again, it has some additional metadata to keep track of like, what's, what each page actually represents. Is it part of the index or some other thing? Things get tricky now if you have multiple files. Because right? now if I want to say get page number 23, I need to know, you know what file is going to have potentially that, that, that page. Right, assuming that they're all part of this, the same table. So there's a thing called the page directory, and it, this will vary per system, but think of it as like a hash table that says, for this page number, it's this uh, you know, directory, this file location, and here's how to jump into it to get the data you need. Right? And then you could, there may, maybe additional data, metadata within the, the header of that file that says, here's what the, the data looks like below me. So again, this page directory is basically essentially a hash table. Is the way you conceptually think about it. Different data systems are going to do uh, different things. But there'll be one sort of page directory, uh, or one entry within, within a page directory per database object that says, like, for, for index Y, here's where to go find the, the file and jump to offsets and get additional metadata. Or for this table, here's where to go find other things. So this page directory is like the database of the database, because it's telling you what files I have, where they're located. And therefore, I need to make sure that this this directory is just more pages on disk, that this thing gets synced up and written to disk in a safe manner uh, along as I'm writing the data pages. So this thing is not updated that often. Right? If, if, your, if your database system is, if you think you're gonna do, do, you know, do a bunch of inserts into a table, you're not just going to allocate one page at a time, although Postgres will do this. Uh, you may want to allocate a gigabyte of data at a time update the page directory, flush that out the disk, then start doing your writes to your, your, uh, you know, to your, to your table itself. Additional metadata we can keep track of the, for, for about the pages we have. We want to keep track of how much free space we have in, per page so that when, it, when a new insert shows up, we're not scanning through sequentially across all the pages to find a free slot or find a free location. We just consult this, and it's going to tell us where to go find the thing we need. We need to make sure that this is actually fail safe because this free space map, sometimes it's called, may actually be wrong because we don't need to flush this as, like we do with the page directory. So this thing actually might be incorrect for us. And so if we go jump to a page, which we think is empty and it's not, we need to be able to you know, go back and find another page. We can also keep track of the, the pages that are either free or empty uh, so that if we want to do compaction and throw them away and, and give, back, give back disk space or reuse it for other things, we can find this quickly. And then some systems will actually keep track on a, on a per page basis what the what the page is going to represent. Like, is it storing data? Is it storing metadata? And so forth. So we can consult that to figure out you know, what we're going to we're actually better jump into when we're looking at things. So in a really simple example here, so this, my page directory is, is at the table or database object level. So if I want to do a lookup on, on, for table x, page 0, I look in the directory. It tells me where to find the file location that corresponds to table x. And then I do that simple arithmetic to jump to a different location. So you can actually see this in, uh, in Postgres. You can, see, you can see the internals of Postgres and how it actually lays out uh, pages and files in, in, in its own data directory and what it's actually maintaining for the page directory. So let me switch over. OK. so. So we're going to do that student table we had before, right? I got three records. So Postgres has a has a extension you can apply called the free, PG free, free space, um, and it'll give you. Uh, you think it's like a special function that is treated like a table, where it'll give you back the space that's available uh, for all the pages within a table. So I'm saying for for the the table student, take the available space and compute the ratio. So this is saying for block number zero or page zero, right? It has 97% uh, is full, right? Which makes sense because again, in Postgres, pages are eight kilobytes. I only have three tuples. 97% of it is full. So let's insert a bunch of fake data, and this will be a Postgres idiom here. 
Um, so this generate series basically just monotonically increases you know, some counter. Uh, and so I can insert 1,000 tuples by invoking the function generate series. And they're all, gonna be, they're all gonna have the same, the same data. So now, uh, to double check that we actually have the data in there, now our table has 1,003 tuples. If I go back and now ask Postgres how much data I have, or how much free space is available on my pages, I got a bunch of zeros. That's kind of weird, right? And sure, yeah, so it, it, I, had, I had one page before. Now I have seven pages. But it's unlikely that I stored exactly, you know, have 100% uh, utilization on that last page, right? That seems kind of odd. So what's going on there? So we can actually go look what the files look like for Postgres. So they have another function called PG Relation File Path. And this gives you back now a, uh, a, a path on the local file system of where the data for this table is actually being stored. So now down below, I can bump this up. Right, so this is saying that the, for, the, for the, the student table, it's in the base directory. So I go to base. I'm going to show you what it looks like here. So this is, this is Postgres data directory. So there's a bunch of folders here, directories in here. I might be hard to see, but there's, one, there's, there's a folder 1, 4, 5, and then PG SQL temp, that's for temp data. But then this one here is 16835, or 385. Let me turn off the, turn down the lights. That one is the, for, for, our, for our table, or sorry, for our database. Is that better? Right? And again, when we ran the command to give me the file path, it told us that it was in 16835. So now it says the, at the, at the within that directory 168385, it's my data's gonna be in some files called 16653. So we, let's go into this. And then we can look at the files, what 16653. Right? So here's here's the table. Again, it's just my files on disk. So this thing here, 16653, uh, this is actually the table data, uh, and it's 56 kilobytes. Uh, again, a multiple of, of eight. And then there's something called the FSM and the VM. VM stands for visibility map. That'll come later when we talk about transactions. We ignore that. But FSM, that's the free space map. Right? That's how Postgres is going to keep track of what pages have uh, free data in it. So now if I go back up here, and let's run that same query we did before. Right? It's still telling us we have a bunch of zeros. And that's because Postgres is not making sure that the free space map is perfectly in sync in memory with, with what's on disk. Right? Because it's not, how this? it's not super important to have this be exactly perfect. We can write it out at some later point. Because again, if we get it wrong, then yeah, we create some new pages. Or, or we may not be able to reuse pages we, uh, that we could have, but eventually that'll all get taken care of. We'll, we would have used the space. So this is a Postgres idiom, but there's a command called vacuum. Think of this as like the garbage collector in Postgres for tables. So if I run that, it comes back pretty quickly because my table is small. And then now, when I, when I run my command, now you see that, again, the first, five, first six pages are, uh, are completely full, but this last one here was, was only 60% or 40% full, right? So the vacuum forced the database system to go look at the data and then update the free space map to keep track of where things are, right? So now let's do something like delete a bunch of random tuples, right? So this is saying delete uh, tuples that, have a, that aren't my original three that I started uh, based on the student ID, and then the random function, if you know, flip a coin, if it's less than 0 0.5, delete it. So we delete about half of them. So again, now if I run the, the query to keep track of my free data, in this case here, it decided to update the free space map right away. Right? And now you can see that a bunch of the pages have uh, free space. Right? So if I, um, if I insert 10 more records and now run vacuum and run that query again, you can see that um, bring this down a little bit. It I started ten more tuples. Oh, you can't see it on this. Um, 
So before, when I ran the query, it said, give me all, tell me what free space I have. For page zero, block number zero, it was at 46% free. Then I said, inserted 10 new tuples. And then now you see the first block is at 40% full. So it decided to insert the new tuples in the first page. Right? And again, this is an example where the relational model is unordered. I didn't, I didn't insert them in the order that, uh, in my table, in the way that they got inserted by the application. It said, I got some free space. Let me put it there. And that's perfectly fine. So real quickly, I'm going to show you uh, additional metadata that SQL Server will can keep track of for you. So this command here basically hits up the, the metadata table uh, for, a t for a table, the student table. And here it tells you I have different page IDs, and then it keeps track of the page types. So there's the index access map and then the data page. So it's keeping track on a per page basis where to find it and what's actually going to be in it. And Postgres doesn't keep track of these things. This is, this is a SQL Server thing. And the various data sets are, are going to do all different stuff. OK? Yes? I'm just curious. Does Postgres have like a concatenate kind of thing where if I want to optimize, like minimize the amount of files used in that case, or like you could have like four different validations? So this question is does, does Postgres have a concatenation yeah, function? So, so, so his, his statement is, uh, when, I, when I after they did the data, we checked the utilization, but the pages ahead were about 40% full. Yeah. Is there a way to force Postgres to, to use more, so essentially start moving data around to yeah. fill in the space? Yeah, that, the vacuum will do that. Okay. Uh, if you call vacuum full, which we'll cover later on, that literally uh, will create a new copy of the table by just scanning through the, the original copy and then writing them in, in, in order that they fill it to, to minimize the number of pages you're using. But that's expensive because you take locks on the whole thing and block anybody else from updating it. So you can do that. Um, different data systems will, will do different things. We'll cover later. later. Yes? When is the vacuum used in application? When is the vacuum used in application? Uh, the, so this question, when is the vacuum used in, applica in application code? You, you typically, as an application, you would not want to call that yourself. Right, because it, it, it runs on, it has various triggers to, to when it wants to run on its own. So for example, if you, if you, if you update, I think 10% of the tuples in a table, then it'll run, right? Or you can set it to be like, it'll run every night or something like that, right? There's ways, to, this is sort of at the administrator level. Yep. Hey. Yes. Why are we storing both table to file mapping and index to file mapping? The question is, why are we storing the, the table to, to file mapping and index file mapping? And this, so, uh, I mean, the, so it's in this example here. There's some the directory is saying if you want to know about table X or other database objects like an index or other things, here's where to go find it, right? Cause, and then because otherwise you'd have to know like oh, I'm trying to access the index and you store hey, separate I, okay. page directory for indexes, separate pages, separate tables. There's no reason not to reuse them. That's all. That's all it means. Yes. His question is, for the index, is for every value on the index. Again, at this point, we don't know anything about values. We don't know anything inside these pages. I'm just saying, like, if, if, if I'm looking up for page 1, 2, 3 on index y, I don't know, I, you know. I'm not saying what I'm looking for inside the index. I'm just saying where to go find a page for it. It's at the lowest level. The page directory will tell you where to go find that page. Then once you land inside that page, then you interpret the page to say, OK, what data structure am I looking at? Is it B plus tree, a hash table, whatever? How to go then find the value within that index? At this point, we don't know anything about what's inside these pages. We don't care. Yes. His question is, where's the free space memory, uh, free space map stored? Is it on disk or is it in memory? It's in both. Some, some data systems will store the free space map as part of the page directory metadata, right? Some of them, like in the case of Postgres, will store it as a separate file that then is mapped in, into memory, or brought into memory. I don't, I don't, mapped sounds like it's using mmap. We're not doing that. OK. okay. So um, I'm check the screen. All right, so again, now we know what the, it's roughly how we're going to organize files. Now we're going to talk about how we're going to organize pages. Um, and as I said, the, with, within a page, there's going to be a header that's going to tell us information about the page. 
And we talked before about the, the case of Oracle where they, they're storing all the, the schema information in the page itself, in the header. Most systems don't do that, but there's other things we don't want to store as well, like what the size of the page is, a checksum. Oftentimes you want to know what, what the version of the database system that created the page is. So like if you upgrade versions of your database system, it's, it's going to scan through all your data and go figure out whether the, the format of the page is an older version and try to change it for you. Well, thank you. Nice. Transaction data, visibility information, we'll cover that later. Uh, Pardon? Some systems will compress data and maybe encode it in a different times. way. We'll cover that next week. Share the screen. There's metadata to say, like, within this so it just page, it's still compressed in this today. manner. Schema information we talked about before. And then sometimes there's additional metadata, like a summary of okay. the data that's inside Good. of a sketch. Like, the, say you, the, you want to keep you. track of the, the, ma again. the min max value for the data. Say that again. Page, right, for, for a given column. Uh, so oh, if my page is really big, maybe I, I just read the header and I'm looking for values within a range, and I know if the min-max value is, is outside the range I'm looking for, then I can just skip reading the rest of the data. We'll see that more in the column stores next week. But again, there's always going to be some header within the page that's going to tell us what's in the page. So now, the, the next question is, how are we going to organize our data within these pages at sort of a, um, or basically, how are we going to lay out the tuples themselves? Right. For now, we're ignoring indexes. We'll cover that later. But like, if we have a bunch of tuples, how are we going to put them in, in, in these pages? And what do we actually want to store with them? So I'm sort of talking about column stores, but that we'll cover next week. But just assume now we're just storing all the data contiguously for a single, single record as a row. And then when that tuple is done, then we have the next record. And we're going to assume also too now for now, but we'll fix that next week that all the attributes for a single tuple are going to fit in a single page, right? So there's basically yeah, yeah, three approaches. Yeah, it's a bit hard to, to hear you over the, the, the uh, tuple voice from the background. We'll cover now. Uh, well, that's uh, fine, that's fine. Uh, and you will just in turn my on your audio in an unordered way. So we'll be more structured in stores, we'll talk next week. Yeah, you can, can you hear me okay? Where basically I'm going to store tuples, but I'm going to store redundant copies of them as they get updated, as if it was like a log. And then index organized storage is what MySQL and SQLite do and other systems do, where I think the, 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 the table is organized as a tree, as a, da as a data structure, and then the, the, and the leaves of the, of the tree will be the actual data itself. So it'll be mixed with like inner nodes and leaf nodes within it as well. But again, we'll, we'll cover that next week. So today I just want to focus on uh, two bonding storage, and then these guys will, will pick up next class. All right, so say we have a page. We want to start putting tuples in it. So how do, we, how do we want to do this? So a straw man approach, meaning it's a bad idea, would just be in our header, we keep track of the number of tuples that we have. And as new tuples get inserted into the database, we just find that, you know, just do the math to jump to the, to, to the, the location of where there's free, free space in the page, and we just start writing it out until we run out of space. And then we move on to the next page. So this is clearly a bad idea because, well, what happens if I delete a tuple? If it's the same size, if they're all fixed length, then that's not a big deal because I just insert it into the next free slot. But now if my data is going to be variable length, meaning every tuple is not going to be the same size, which is very common, right? Think of your email addresses. Those are always different sizes. Your Android ID is always a different size. How am I going to make this all work now in my, in my, my page? So this approach is actually what log structured databases are going to do, but they'll do it. They'll still handle variable size tuples. We'll cover that next time. But for our purposes here, this is actually a bad idea because there's, it's going to be tricky for us to always be able to find free space uh, to store things we want to store. And now too, if we start moving things around in our page, like maybe we want to put four after three, now we've got to go update everything that may be pointing to tuple four, like an index, to say, hey, your, your location got changed. So a better approach is what is called slotted pages. Now, what I'm going to describe here is the high level of what a slotted page looks like. This is what pretty much every row-oriented data system does. May not be exactly as I'm describing here, like the details will be slightly different. But at a high level, they're going to have some slot array, and they're going to move things around, and, and it's going to work basically the same way. What they store in the header might be slightly different. So the way a slotted page layout is going to work is that at the beginning of our page, we're going to have this slot array. right? Just you know, fixed length offsets to different to, to locations in the in our page. And then now at the bottom of the of the, the, the page, 
it will be all the fixed length and variable length tuple data. And the idea here is that the, as we add new tuples, we're going to append them to the, the end of the page. So it's going to grow from the, from the end to the beginning. And then the slot array is going to grow from the beginning to the end. And at some point, they'll meet in the middle because we run out of space, and our page is full. So this slot array is just getting these, these offsets in, in, inside the page to say, if you want you know, the, the tuple at position 1, jump to this offset, and here's where it is. And again, the slot array grow, grows this way. The, the data grows this way. And at some point, you run out of space. So now, if I delete data in this approach, so if I say I delete tuple uh, 3, then all I need to do is just mark it as being deleted in the slot array with the header to say this thing is, has been emptied, and I'm done. You're shaking your head no. Why? You're shaking your head no? So you, you, you made this, that was like, as if it's a bad idea. OK, OK. So in this case here, yeah, I could, I could delete tuple 3, and I don't have to update anything. Right? I could just leave the data where it is. That's fine. Some systems actually will decide, OK, well, and now I got this free space here, so let me compact things. So they'll, say, take, move tuple 4 back to where 3 was, compact it, free up space, and then now I just update its slot array offset to point to its new location. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? He says bad idea. Why? Yes. Oh, we got no, space in those empty slots. He says, if if you want to turn a new tuple into it, I have enough free space. I'm okay. It's fine. Yeah, but what if what if I have a small tuple that could fit in there? Yeah, but you always have like wasted space with this thing. You always have wasted space, but I certainly would have a lot less wasted space if I can compact it this way. In the back, yes. He says, if you have a lot of small tuples, uh, you have to shift things in a bunch of different areas, and it would be very wasteful. Yeah. Is that bad? So, right, so the answer here, it depends. Right? It's not to cop out. Right? So in this case here, uh, and you're also you're thinking about it in terms of, of, of you're ignoring disk. Getting things from disk is super expensive. Once it's in memory, it's essentially free or cheap to work on. So if I do this, if I compact things to get, free up space, that's sitting in memory. That's fast. That's, that's not a big deal. Versus like having to go fetch another page and bring that to memory because I don't have free space in this thing. Right? But though, as I said before, you want to have, try to have most of the data you need sitting in memory. So therefore, uh, when I'm doing this shuffling around, I have to hold the latch on the page. Latch is a lock. We'll cover that in a second. All right. Like, I'm holding the latch on this page for a longer time, so other people may be trying to access this page, but they can't get to it because I'm moving things around. So they get blocked. So some systems will actually move these things around. SQL Server does this thing. Oracle does this. Postgres does not. And there's, there's pros and cons to all these approaches, right? All right, we're well over time. Um, so let me break here. Uh, we'll come back to record IDs because I, I want to switch over to, to the Neon talk. Um, but this slot of page architecture is, is, is fundamental to pretty much how every row store system is actually going to uh, operate on. OK? All right, so let's see if uh, we can get to Hecky. OK, so again, this is Hecky. He's awesome. Uh, you're a Postgres <laughs> committer, right? I am. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, let me get started. So yes. I'm, I, I do have a slide on that, actually. So yes, I am a Postgres committer. I've been hacking on Postgres for, for many, many years. There's a picture of me, like 15 years younger, wearing a Postgres uh, sweater. Um, and now I'm a co-founder of Neon, but I worked for many different Postgres companies around Postgres for a long time. So I was eavesdropping, listening to you speak for the last 10 minutes, and it was a lot of familiar stuff. <laughs> it's funny to hear that uh, with, the, with the tuple format and all that. Um, but yeah, so what is Neon? We provide Postgres as a cloudless, uh, serverless cloud service, and it's developer friendly. Kind of the unique features we have is, is branching and auto scaling. But really, what is probably more interesting for you guys is uh, the architecture. Uh, so all of those things are kind of enabled by the architecture, which is separating compute, where how we separate compute and storage. 
Uh, I'm going to dive right into that. So separation of compute and storage. First of all, compute in this case means Postgres. So we run Postgres uh, in the cloud for you. And that is the compute part. Like that's the part that our users actually interact with. Like they connect to Postgres, they run their queries there, uh, same as any other Postgres instance. The storage part is, is something that we wrote from scratch uh, in Rust. Like it's a, it's a whole new system. And uh, it, it's, it's designed to work with, with Postgres. And it knows, it knows a little bit about Postgres's like page format and, and uh, the write ahead log and so forth. But the way it works is that whenever Postgres modifies a page uh, normally, like it writes it to the write ahead log, and it also keeps it in the buffer cache as a dirty page and so forth. But what we do, we intercept the while stream. So whenever Postgres makes any modifications, they go to the write ahead log, and we stream the write ahead log to, to our storage system. And the storage system consists of a few parts. I won't go into too, many, too much detail, but kind of the page servers is where we have most of the code. Uh, but the safe keepers is the first thing that intercepts the wall. And there is a consensus algorithm on going on there uh, based on Paxos where the write ahead log gets streamed to the safe keepers and the safe keepers kind of make sure that you don't lose the recent transactions. So at least three of the safe keepers have to receive the wall and then we acknowledge the commit uh, to Postgres as, as committed. So this is kind of reusing all the same machinery that Postgres normally has for synchronous replication or safe keepers or storage system kind of looks like a, a synchronous replica uh, from Postgres's point of view up to this point. But then there's a lot of a lot of stuff that happens in the page server side uh, to, to process the write ahead log. And what is kind of unique about this storage system is that we we keep all of the logs, like we keep all of the history of your database, uh, but we process it in, into a format, into what looks a little bit like a log structured merge tree where we can quickly access any of the pages. Uh, and that becomes important when, when you when we're implementing stuff like branching. Uh, time travel query is another very cool feature that Postgres can do, which is much more harder with, with vanilla Postgres. The, so the way this kind of looks like from Postgres's point of view is that we, we plug in at a pretty low level, so pretty close to where Postgres normally like writes an eight kilobyte page, uh, reads an eight kilobyte uh, page from disk. Uh, we kind of intercept that call and we do this network request to the page server instead. And then the page server will reconstruct that page using the write ahead log it has and, and any old page images it has. But that's kind of the gist of it. So the page server reconstructs the page and sends it back to Postgres. And all of these requests also contain like an LSN number. So the, the request is always get page number one, two, three at this specific LSN. And that's what allows you to do the time travel query because you can just ask for an older page version or any page version you want by specifying the right LSN. Now, one interesting thing about this architecture is that because the page servers handle all of the reconstruction of these pages, uh, when Postgres normally writes a page to disk, like evicts a page from the buffer cache, uh, that operation is just a no op on Neon. So we just throw the page away uh, because the storage system can always reconstruct it from the wall it has. So you, you don't need to write it back. And that means that there is no checkpoint in, in Neon. Like you don't need to do checkpoints. It's done continuously by the, uh, the storage system. Um, or we, we still do go through the motions of a checkpoint. Like the code is there, but it doesn't actually do much because it just throws away the pages that you would normally write to disk. So the storage system is a single writer node, a uh, single writer system. We don't try to do like distributed queries or distributed uh, transactions. Turns out those things are hard. Uh, I'm sure you, you will have courses on, on those things as well, but there's always trade-offs and like either with performance or consistency or whatnot, and it, it tends to be difficult. And it's especially hard to retrofit like a distributed system on top of an existing database like Postgres. Uh, but in practice, we can, we can support multiple readers so you can scale out your reads. And that means that you kind of free up the capacity for the writes in a single node. And you can actually process quite a lot of transactions uh, in a single node these days, like uh, computers keep getting faster. Uh, the storage system is multi-tenant written in Rust, uh, and it allows you to do these things I mentioned. And it's open source if you want to take a look. But actually, one and, and there is like an earlier presentation of that that I gave at Andy's uh, database series. So you might want to look at that for more details on the storage system. But what I want to also touch a little bit is how we actually make Postgres serverless. Um, well, one part of it that is that separation of compute and storage. So that allows us to spin up Postgres very fast. 
Like you don't need to do wallet recovery when you start Postgres on Neon because it can just connect to the page servers and start asking for the pages at whatever point you want without having to kind of sequentially replay the logs. Um, that allows us to kind of spin up Postgres very quickly. Then the other important part is a proxy, which is pretty straightforward. This is the proxy that intercepts the connections, but then it goes through the, all of this stuff to orchestrate and sp start up the Postgres servers if it's not already running and so forth. Um, and finally, we put Postgres on, in the VMs in Kubernetes, and there's a lot of orchestration involved in, in how, how to actually manage all that. Uh, one part of this is auto scaling. So VMs can be auto, you know, scaled up and down. We run a lot of VMs on a single big host. Um, but there are some interesting questions on when do you want to upscale and downscale? Like CPU is kind of straightforward. Like, you know, if you need more CPU resources, you, you can have more. And you can kind of never run out of CPU. Things will just, if, if you don't have enough CPU resources, then things will just go slower, but nothing, everything still works. Uh, disk is a little harder. Like if a query needs a lot of disk, you have to provide that disk or otherwise it fails. So the, the question there is to just make sure you have enough basically, but memory is hard. We haven't fully solved this problem yet either, but these are the kind of problems we're dealing with at the moment and working, working really hard. But I kind of want to plant this idea to you guys. Uh, so when do you actually want to add more memory to a, a database server? Well, kind of trivial cases, if you're, if you're about to run out of memory, then you might have a more, then you probably want to have more memory so you don't run out. Although there's exemptions there, like what well, if you have a runaway query that is just going to consume infinite amounts of memory if you let it run? Like, do you still want to just keep adding more? Or, you know, when do you actually want to cut that off? Um, but that's that's pretty straightforward. Kind of the ne next level is that you might want to add more query, more memory to a system so that you can have a bigger cache. Like Postgres can run pretty big queries with very little memory. It will just be slow. Uh, but all of the core parts can like work with little memory if you only have a little memory available. Like sorting, for example, you start with the quick sort and then you uh, move on to on disk sorting, or you know, you can change the, tune the, choose the size of the cache the way you want. But when would you want to add more memory? Like, if if you would add more memory to your system, maybe your database fits in RAM, and now it's really fast because it's an in-memory database. But you also don't want to just always do that because there's no limit to how much you might need. So that's an, kind of an unsolved problem. But it and it also depends on the cost. Like, how much are you willing to pay for those things? Kind of the third level is. Like, what if you added more memory and now you could do a different, completely different query plan? And that affects the optimizer too. Like, if you knew that you had more memory, you might have chosen a hash join instead of a merge join or something. And that kind of changes the game altogether. Like, you can't just look at what the query is doing when it's executing. You actually have to predict what it would do if you had more memory. You haven't solved that problem, but it's an interesting research problem that we are hopefully trying to do something uh, this autumn. We love Postgres, so I'm a Postgres hacker myself. Um, so that's kind of a given uh, with the company. But uh, there's a lot of business reasons too. Like we we haven't changed the planner, the executor, all of the extensions work. Like there's a big ecosystem of Postgres tools out there. There's also a lot of like blog posts on how to do things with Postgres and like tuning advice, all of that. And we try to make sure that all of those things, all of those little random snippets of information that you find on the internet would also apply to Neon because that makes it easy for people to work with it and uh because it's the kind of the uh it's bug and feature compatible with upstream postgres which makes it a lot easier to you know if you already have that experience one interesting thing is that i, I want to point out is that postgres still handles mvcc the way it always does in neon even though our storage system uh like keeps all of the history so we could actually go and do time travel query that way but we don't use that for the MVCC part. Postgres still handles that the same way with you know, different raw versions on pages as always. That was kind of all I had prepared. I hope you have a lot of good questions for me and uh, I, hopefully I will also have some answers. All right, we have time for like one or two questions. Raise your hand and I'll repeat it to them. Yes. So his question is, what is the difference between Neon and Planet Scale? But despite, despite otherwise, uh, other than just being MySQL versus Postgres. 
I don't, I don't know plan scale very well. I don't think they do the kind of storage system we have, uh, where where you can do branches and uh, like they. I think they do that differently. But to be honest, I don't I haven't looked at the details of how exactly can they I, do it. Can I answer? Sure, nothing. Yeah. Can I answer it? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, plan of scale is doing doing the distribution at the front level, the the, the front of the system, right? Meaning it's it's based on this thing called a test that came out of YouTube. It's how they scale MySQL on YouTube. So query shows up, at, and at the front line, they say, okay, where do I need to go and move data around? In case of Neon, they're doing distribution at the lower level, meaning like they, you hit Postgres up, they fake Postgres out thinking it's talking to its regular file system, but instead it's talking to this Neon storage thing that he built. And then they do all the distribution below that. So it's like one comes from the top, one comes from the bottom. Thank you. Other, <laughs> other questions? So, I, so uh, Hickey, right now you're also in Europe, right? Yes, Finland. He's in Finland, so we appreciate him. I guess it's what, 9, 9 p.m. Um, and then, so there's uh, one of our best former students, Chi Zhang, is actually a full-time employee at uh, Neon right now. And then one of our best undergrads is doing an internship with uh, Yuchen Liu is with them as well. And you're taking them to Portugal next week? Yeah, we're going to an off-site meeting next week. Okay. That's yeah, going to so be awesome. That. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's thank Hickey real quickly. Thank you. And actually, uh, one quick thing. If you interview at Neon, do not tell them you're not as good as Chi, OK? You may not know who Chi is, but like, I've had two database companies tell me that students show up and tell me they're not as good as one of our former students. Do not say that, OK? You're all <laughs> awesome, OK? All right. Hey, all right, Hickey, thank you so much. Uh, all right, guys, have a good weekend, and then see you uh, on Monday next week, OK? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker Rhymes I create, rotate, add a wave Too quick to duplicate, fill a breeze, add a skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold a real tight Then I'm in flight we ignite, blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Records still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off.